Ireland is renowned for its horses and horsemen. For centuries, the Irish have established a reputation for excellence with all breeds, but none more so than with the thoroughbred. Dermot Well grew up in a racing environment in which there were already two established giants in the training ranks and a host of others aspiring to match their achievements. Talk about fierce competition, but the young Weld saw there were still unexplored avenues available to one adventurous enough to try them. More than 40 years ago, the young graduate in veterinary science was already much travelled and full of ambition. First ambition in racing probably was just to to be a success, uh, to do a good job, to make my parents proud, and uh, without any particular big race to win, uh, just to be able to train winners, to make horses run. Well, you've been training 42 years, I think. Uh, you have, you started in the 70s. Now, there were some big names, have always been big names in the training ranks in Ireland. Who were the, who were the heroes at that time for you? Uh, well, Ireland has been fortunate to have some wonderful trainers and, of course, Vincent O'Brien and Paddy Prendergast were the two huge names. And Paddy Prendergast had been three times champion trainer of England, training from Ireland, and, well, Vincent O'Brien is legendary. So, when you started, did you think, well, they have dominated uh, in Ireland, they've gone to England and they've mm -hmm. won the big races there, did you think you, it, was, it was time to look further afield? Did you think that the, the international aspect of the whole game was, was, uh, was going to change? I think two things stirred me towards the international aspect. One was the competition at home, that here were two brilliant trainers and they were very hard to beat. And uh, while I was very fortunate with the races I was winning, um, I just knew it was very tough in Ireland. And the other thing was I had travelled a lot after I graduated as a vet, I remember I had worked in both Australia and America and South Africa. So I was um, very familiar with world racing. And I really thought it was time that racing became international and it was going to happen sooner rather than later. So maybe I was the first on the bandwagon to recognise what I termed the internationalisation of horse racing. Let's look at those early days. You were in the back stretch at Belmont Park as a, as a vet. Uh, you went to Australia. You worked for Tommy Smith, Correct. who was the, the leading trainer in Sydney, I think, for yeah. 33, 34 years. Yeah. What, did you, what did, ex did you gain from that experience? You well, <clears throat> working for somebody like Tommy Smith, you have to pick up knowledge. Uh, an amazing man, amazing trainer, and uh, who was a great insight. I also worked, before I used to, I used to write it for Tommy in the mornings and then I'd go to work for Percy Sykes, one of the most famous vets of all times, in the afternoon. So between Tommy Smith and Percy, uh, you'd be, <laughs> you had to learn. And it was very different and from, you know, looking back, you would say that Smith and Sykes were, were they were light years ahead of, of their, <clears throat> uh, their rivals. What were they doing that was so special? Well, it's hard really to put, it's like any person that's very good at what they're, at their own particular field you can't really pinpoint one thing that they do. Uh, it's just a number of small things that they did very well. You're not the only trainer who uh, is qualified as a vet. John Ox, your, sure. your current Doesn't colleague, is a, is a vet. Mark right, Johnson, Johnson and Midland sure. Sure. is also. They're the, they're the ones that we know. There are others as well. Yes, indeed. Do you think it's an advantage to, be, uh, to have that veterinary science background or do you think it's a hindrance when it comes to... to well, it's certainly, it's certainly not a hindrance. Uh, whether it's a help or not, I don't know. Um, I don't do any of my own veterinary work naturally nowadays. We're too busy. But maybe you understand the mind of a horse better, possibly. But uh, it's not a hindrance. We'll leave it at that. Every successful trainer needs wealthy, trusting owners willing to invest in the best bloodstock. Without them, the trainer can be the best in his field, but will achieve very little. It is a cycle. Success attracts good owners, but that success does not come without access to the best horses. And that only comes through owners willing to pay for them. Right from the start, Dermot Weld has never really had any worries in finding the owners, or the horses for that matter. Yeah, I've been very fortunate and very honoured to train for some wonderful owners who I very much appreciate their support. 
And without them, I would never have achieved what I've been fortunate to achieve. Who was the first one that really sort of helped you along? I suppose Bert Firestone uh, was the first major owner that I had. And uh, it was very appropriate then that the first classic winner I would train would be Blue Wind for him when she won the Epsom Oaks. And of course then went on to win the Irish Oaks and was champion three-year-old filly of Europe. And what was the, the, the origins of, of that meeting with Bert Firestone? Uh, it goes back to when I used to work as, as, a, as a young vet in, in America. And uh, that's, how I came, that's how I met him, actually, through a very good friend, a man called Monsignor Melton. And uh, it was the Monsignor that introduced me to Bert Firestone. Both of them were very much involved in show jumping in the early days. And uh, it went from there. He bought Giltan Stud and, and uh, I started to train for him. And Bert Firestone, he, he had horses for many, many years. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, I think his interest in Irish racing, European racing, seemed to diminish a little bit um, after a couple of decades. Well, that's true. But I had some very good horses for him, like Theatrical, and um, was an exceptional colt. We were unlucky. We just got beaten neck by Law Society for the Derby. Oh, I had trained a number of Royal Ascot winners for him, Nantitius being a, a very, very good filly that won the Ribblesdale, and, and we had a lot of good horses. Moyglay Stud Farm, their mm -hmm. colours are still with you today, Free Eagle being the latest flagship. Uh, over the years, they've been a, a very, very good supplier of horses to, to Rosewell House. They have indeed. It's, it's, um, I was honoured to train for Mr Hafner for so many years, and now for Eva Marie. And uh, we're fortunate to continue on and come up with such a lovely horse in Free Eagle. Mr. Hafner, a real character and a real racing man? Well, he was, it was his hobby. And um, he was a wonderful man to train for. And uh, we had a wonderful relationship. I think what I'd done in many years, 35 years, I think I trained for him. Uh, we never had a disagreement in 35 years. Um, we discussed. He was a man that believed in confidence and um, uh, certainly helped me along my career, I can assure you. Others uh, on the role of honour, um, Sir Michael Smurfett, who's... Uh... Yeah, I've, had, I've trained many, many winners for, for Michael Smurfett and he was in small syndicates that we had and um, uh, I was... No, we've had numerous, numerous winners, especially we had a lot of winners in Galway, a lot of happy days. And of course, we had Zag Greb, the one the Irish Derby. And uh, he was a very special horse, and that was a very special day. Well, Zag Greb, I think, from memory, was, was part owned by uh, Sir Michael Smurfett, also Michael Watt, and Alan Paulson, uh, who, who you trained committed for. Uh, yeah, well, committed was a, was a very brilliant sprinter. Uh, I won the Prix de la Baie de Longchamp with her twice, uh, two years running as a four year old and as a five year old. And. Uh, she was an outstanding filly, champion sprinter of Europe. Um, she was a joy to train. So you've been rubbing shoulders with some of the really big names in the ownership ranks. Um, what is it, do you think, that they, they have in common, if there is, in fact, something they do have in common? No, oh, I think they're all different in their own spheres, in their own ways. They all love racing. They've all been wonderful supporters of racing, and we've been very fortunate to have them involved in our industry. And do you sort of actively court these, these owners? Do you go out and sort of say, I'd like to meet this sort of... No, no, it doesn't of... happen that way. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. It's like any business, you know what I mean? If you're successful, naturally, it uh, draws attention. And you're right, it, it is a business, and it's, it, it is really big business, isn't it? Well, that's what it is, you know what I mean? It's become more business-like now than it, in the early days when I started training. Uh, it was not, there wasn't the same finances involved. It's always been tough, but um, it's a big business nowadays. Internationally, Weld has been a trailblazer, an explorer willing to go where others had never dared contemplate. Racing's modern day Christopher Columbus started ticking off the countries a very long time ago. But arguably his most challenging quest was to produce a horse capable of winning the final leg of the American Triple Crown. I thought he's a horse, I knew he was a horse that would handle the top of the ground and it was a two-year-old race, the Lord of Futurity, which was a grade one. 
and um, I decided to go for that. It was in those days easy enough to get to, and uh, actually we got a flight into Baltimore for him, and um, all set to run, and hopefully win the large maturity. He'd been a good two-year-old here. He'd won the Tyros. He was progressive. Uh, Mr. Hafner thought it was a good idea, and of course it rained overnight, and it was taken off the turf, and uh, they ran it on the dirt. The rest is history. He duly won the Laurel Futurity, and uh, two weeks later we actually brought him down to Florida for the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile uh, on the dirt, and um, he ran an excellent race. He just got beaten, so we brought him back and decided that um, we train him for the Triple Crown, or we'd look at the Kentucky Derby. And in those days, it was literally impossible, I felt anyway, to go for the Kentucky Derby because it, it, it just, the quarantine was just not on, the travel, it just didn't balance out. So we decided instead uh, we'd have a crack at the Belmont with him. And again, the rest is history. So a little bit of luck there, as you say. Yeah. Uh, initially, you probably wouldn't have tried him on the dirt. Well, well, who's to know? I wouldn't totally agree because the plan had been to run him uh, in Laurel. And if all went well, then we would go on down to the Breeders' Cup uh, in Florida. That had been the plan. So really, we kind of stayed with that plan. So he would have run on the dirt in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, which he did. And I think he started his career, was it at Galway? Yeah, he started his career in Galway. He won the maiden in Galway there, and he went on to be a stakes horse, then winning the Taurus, and uh, then he went. We raced him in America. And have you been searching for the horse who who could be sort of one to emulate him ever since, or, or was it not really? It's on, just on the back burner. Look, horses come, and and you look at their different qualities, and if the right horse comes along, you'd be delighted. But it's he was an amazing horse because he was a very tough, very genuine horse, and. Um, he was just the right horse for the right race. When you're talking about uh, the different quarantine that there are around the world, uh, and I suppose there was none more prohibitive, if you like, than Australia, uh, and it was around the early 90s, I think, that you were starting to make inquiries about Australia and whether those quarantine laws would actually change. Uh, I mean, did you try for many years to, to take a horse down there, or was Vintage Crop no, sort of no, the first? No, Vintage Crop was the first, because really nobody even thought about it before that. It was just not practical, it was impossible really, because of the quarantine situation, that uh, you had to quarantine with the other horses, the stallions or whatever, and you couldn't exercise. So it wasn't practical or possible to go to Australia. and. Um, we had to work very hard. He could have run. I entered him in the Melbourne Cup the year before he won. And um, it just wasn't possible. And uh, I think by entering him through the attention of Les Benton and David Burke. And uh, they said, what's this Irish horse entered in the race? And they contacted me and I explained all the problems that I had and be between everybody and the great help that I got from the Department of Agriculture in Canberra. Uh, we got to change the quarantine rules, which meant that horses could go uh, from the Northern Hemisphere to race in Australia. As a vet, did it strike you as rather odd, some of the, the, the laws and regulations that were in place? Well, they were pretty draconian in those days. And um, it's very hard for people to believe nowadays just how difficult it was to get everything changed uh, so that a horse could travel from Ireland to run in a race in Australia. It took us the full year to get everything online. And those laws, I suppose, would have been set up uh, during a time where the only only way uh, horses would go to Australia would be as stallions and, and they would stay there forever. Yeah, most horses would have gone by boat and then in the early days they, they flew, but they had to fly via California. And uh, we had to get the flight path of the planes changed. We had to convince the authorities um, not to be worried about African horse sickness and different diseases if the plane stopped on one of the African continents. So there was, there was, there was a huge amount of detail and paperwork uh, went into the year to prepare uh, to allow the horse to run the race. 